This is the fifth in a series of messages designed to give you an overview of the Holy Bible. It's so easy once you get started in the 66 different books of our Bible to get a little bit confused. John G. Sachs wrote a very humorous poem about that. It is called The Six Men of Indostan. It goes like this. It was six men of Indostan, the learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against its broad and sturdy side, it once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Oh, what have we here? So round, so smooth, so very sharp to me, tis mighty clear the wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take its squirming trunk within his hands, thus up and boldly spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like, tis mighty plain, quoth he, the marvel of an elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, E'en the blindest man can see what this resembles most, deny the fact you can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on its swinging tail which fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all of them were wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant which none of them have seen. We're going to try and avoid that problem today by allowing Jesus Christ to be our theology. The word theology literally signifies the word of God, and our theology will revile, re, revolve around God. And in this particular lesson, we're going to seek to ascertain the nature of God. Now, the word God or Godhood or Godhead appears but three times. Maybe I should restate that. The word Godhead appears but three times, the word God many times. But Godhead or Godhood refer to the entire nature of God, just as priesthood refers to the entire nature of the priest and the function of priests. And the first usage of the term Godhead in the scriptures is found in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. This particular passage reveals a speech which Paul gave to the philosophers on Mars Hill. In this particular speech, he talks about the Godhead and reminds them that it's not like anything which man can devise, either physically or Philosophically, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And he pointed out that they had around them all sorts of idols. Those who visited the ruins of ancient Athens said there were 17,000 images and idols which had been discovered by the archaeologists in that city. Paul saw all of this, so you're very religious people. But they were really ignorant of God. And in verse 29, he said, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In other words, the infinite God whom we serve, who created the vast heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, is not like anything which we can devise or imagine, either physically or philosophically. The Godhead is not like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. The next use of Godhead is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. In this particular passage, the scriptures teach the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Now, to say that invisible things can be clearly seen is indeed a paradox. It was my privilege to hear Dr. Henry Morris lecture on this several years ago, and let me give to you the essence of his remarks. He said that 
invisible things are to be clearly seen from the creation of the world. Scientists, and Dr. Morris is a scientist, scientists in particular ought to be able to discern something of the nature of God from the created universe. Now, he said there are two things about God that we can learn from the universe. First of all, we learn something about his eternal power. Secondly, we learn about his divinity or his nature, or as the King James Version says, we learn about his Godhead. Now, I'm not going to talk about the eternal power of God from this particular passage, though it's a very interesting subject to pursue, but not particularly that which will be germane to our discussion today. But I want to talk to you about the Godhead because there is a sense in which the created universe reveals the nature of God. Dr. Moore said that everything in the universe is either space or mass or time. What is space? Space is the invisible background where everything happens. What happens in space? Well, phenomena occur there. And time is the ingredient which enables us to experience the phenomena that occur in space. Now, we could substitute Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for space, phenomena, and time, and what we have said about the one would equally apply to the other. For God is invisible. He is like space. No man has seen God at any time. Well, the second person of the Godhead is Jesus Christ, who is God made visible. Everywhere there is space, something is happening. There is no such thing as empty space. In every part of the room where you now are, there are sound waves, heat waves, light waves, or some physical object, and Jesus is omnipresent in a sense, just as God is omnipresent. But the way we experience Jesus in this day and age is by means of the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in a sense one. Now, each dimension is in itself a trinity. For example, the reality of space is length, breadth, and height. Again, the first dimension is invisible. You don't see length until it has width. A line on a blackboard is invisible until it has some width which makes it visible to the human eye. But we live in a, in a three dimensional world, so we experience things in the third dimension. We reference them in the first, see them in the second, and experience them in the third. What is phenomena? Well, every physical thing is, of course, composed of atoms. And every physical thing is, in a sense, energy, a form of energy. So the energy begins in an unseen form, and it appears to us in light, heat, sound, waves and motion and movement, but it is experienced in the third dimension. So, uh, with future, present, and past, time is three-dimensional. The future is unseen. When we see the future, it is the present, but by the time we experience it, it is the past. So we have a triune God who has manifested himself to us in a trinity of trinities. But the first usage of Godhead in Acts 17, 29, and here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, are not as strong a word as we find over in the second chapter of the book of Colossians and the ninth verse. In this particular passage, we are told not to be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. It's so easy for us to try and reason out God, but we have a God who is ultimately beyond human reason. We have a an infinite God and only a finite man uh, mind. We can no more completely understand all there is about God than we can understand infinity or eternity. It's impossible for us to think of going out billions and trillions of light years and building a wall and not having something on the other side. We cannot conceive of space that goes on without an end or time that goes on without an end. And so God, in order that we might understand his nature, condescended to become a man. And in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, we read, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Understanding the nature of God is not some irrelevant tangent, but is at the very heart and core of understanding the sacred scriptures. The scriptures were originally given to the Jewish nation, and they began to study the Bible in great earnest. As a matter of fact, I am told that Every young Jewish boy was required to memorize, first of all, the book of Leviticus, and then as his life progressed, he would memorize other books of the Bible. They were tremendous Bible students. They counted the jots and tittles of the Hebrew law and were perhaps more conversant with the Holy Bible than you will ever be or I will ever be, and yet I really feel like they missed the point of the Scriptures. And it would be like someone 
uh, in the continent of Africa, we will say, who began walking across the jungle. And he began making maps and charts. And he began to try and explain to his children what the world was all about based upon his own experience and leaving records for his children. And after generations and generations had gone by, literally thousands of years perhaps, uh, along comes Christopher Columbus, and he tries to communicate to these people that the world is round. And it was impossible for them to understand that, even though they had been studying the earth meticulously for literally thousands of years. And so this is what happened with reference to the Jewish nation and Bible study, as Jesus Christ, whom you will recall, was the author of the Bible. He came to the world and began to communicate what the Bible was all about. And the Jewish people, because they had been studying the Bible from the wrong perspective, nailed him to a cross. And still more interesting, it was their understanding of the Bible that caused them to put him to death. Pilate couldn't understand it. He said, well, he hadn't done anything wrong. But the Jews said, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die. Let me share with you just a little bit from the Jewish Mishnah. Now, the Talmud was the written law which the Jewish people had, but in addition to the written law, they had oral traditions which were also written down. And this large book of over 800 pages is a record of the Jewish oral law. Now, there was a commandment which contained eight words given in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments by God on Mount Sinai, which said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These people who were Bible students were very interested in observing the law of God and in keeping the law of God, and so they began to say, well, we need to remember the Sabbath day, and we're supposed to enforce it among those around us, and we're not to let any animal, animals do work. And when they forgot to observe the Sabbath, they suffered as a nation because of it. So they became extremely careful about Sabbath observation. Beginning with the second section of the Mishnah, on page 100 in this particular volume, we have this regulation regarding the Sabbath. Now, I'm going to read the paragraph here, and it will give you at least a flavor of the mentality which the Jewish people came to in the time of Christ. There are two, which are indeed four kinds of going out on the Sabbath for him that is inside, and two, which are indeed four for him that is outside. Thus, if a poor man stood outside and the householder inside, and the poor man stretched his hand inside and put aught into the householder's hands or took aught from it and brought it out. The poor man is culpable, which means guilty, and the householder is not culpable. If the householder stretched his hand outside and put aught in the poor man's hand or took aught from it and brought it in, the householder is culpable and the poor man is not culpable or guilty. But if the poor man stretched his hand inside the house and took aught from it or put aught into it and the poor man brought it out, neither is culpable. And if a householder stretched his hand outside and the poor man took aught from it or put aught into it, that is the householder brought it in, neither is culpable. Well, generally speaking, that means that the, uh, the only way that you could exchange anything on the Sabbath day according to the Jewish tradition was by doing it exactly over the threshold. If you reached outside the house, you were guilty. If somebody else reached inside the house, they were guilty. But if you exchanged it right over the threshold, then neither was guilty according to Jewish traditions. Let me read to you on page 106 the 39 forms of work which were forbidden on the Sabbath day according to Jewish tradition. The main classes of work are 40 save 1. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating or dyeing it, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying a knot, loosening a knot, sewing two stitches, tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, scraping it or cutting it up, writing two letters, erasing it, in order to write two letters, building, pulling down, putting out a fire, lighting a fire, striking with a hammer, and taking out aught from one domain into another. These are the main classes of work, 40, save one. Now, it's not enough to, to simply say you can't 
carry something on the Sabbath day, you begin to have to specify what could be carried. So on the very next page, they talk about carrying milk. Now, if you could sip the amount of milk that you carried, that was legitimate. If it was the amount which you could gulp, that was not permitted. You could take enough honey to put on a sore, but no more. You could take enough oil to anoint the smallest member, but no more. You could carry enough water to rub off eye plaster, but no more. And so the Jewish people had literally hundreds and thousands of regulations trying to understand the simple law. And Jesus came and said, no, you've under misunderstood the whole purpose of the Bible. The Bible, he said, can be summarized in only two commandments. One of them involves giving the right honor to God, and the second involves giving the right honor to your fellow man. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The scribes and Pharisees could never speak with authority. They were never quite certain how far they could go or exactly what they could do on the Sabbath day. But Jesus, operating from a totally different principle, operated boldly. He spoke with authority, the Bible says, and not like the scribes. When he saw someone on the Sabbath day with a withered hand, he didn't hesitate to heal them because he said the Sabbath day was made for man and not man for the Sabbath day. Now, again, I want to point out that what we're talking about right now is the very essence of understanding God. It is beginning with Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone, and then erecting the household of faith around him. The Jews made the mistake of rejecting the cornerstone. In ancient times, they began with a building by laying the cornerstone, and then the dimensions of the building and uh, the various directions from the cornerstone were all measured from that. The cornerstone was a point of reference. Everything else started there and revolved around the cornerstone. But the Jewish people rejected Jesus, who was God manifest in the flesh. And when they threw him out, the Bible says, instead of something useful and practical, he became to the Jews a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We're going to allow Jesus, I hope, to be God. We're going to understand his nature, that God is love, and whoever loves is begotten of God and knows God. And we're not going to make the mistakes, if we'll do that, that the Jewish people made throughout all of Bible history. Now let me give you several passages in the Bible which reflect the difficulty and problems which the Jews were having. Let's turn now to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has been called the gospel prophet, and he prophesied some eight centuries before Jesus Christ was born in the manger of Bethlehem. According to Isaiah chapter 1, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Now those of you who are serious students of the Bible will perhaps want to turn back to Second Chronicles chapter 26, and you will find in chapter 26 the story of Uzziah. You will find in chapter 27 the story of Jotham, in chapter 28 the story of Ahaz, and in chapter 29 the life of Hezekiah. And three of these four kings were essentially good kings. They made mistakes and had some problems, but essentially their reigns were good reigns. The one exception was Ahaz, who was a very evil king. But during this period of some 60 years that Isaiah prophesied, their land was invaded over, well, it was invaded three times. The first time by a military coalition composed of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel. The next two times by the kingdom of Assyria, first of all under Sargon and secondly under Sennacherib. So the people knew what it was to endure hardship and privation, to have war and desolation all about them. Now the problem with these people, even though they had been studying the Bible, even though they had been committing it to memory, was that they didn't understand the nature of God. And they thought that what God wanted was all of the rituals. And they thought that because they had been memorizing the book of Leviticus. And they saw all the rituals there, and they assumed that by doing the rituals, they were going to be pleasing unto God. And so Isaiah accused them of ignorance. Note in chapter th uh, 1 and verse 3, he said, The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doesn't know my people doth not consider. He went on to describe some of the hardship and privation that they were experiencing because of their sin. Your country's desolate, he said in verse 7. Your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it in your presence. It's desolate and overthrown by strangers. 
Now, let's skip on down to verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, and give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, a calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They're a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? These were the very things that God had commanded. He wanted them to observe the new moons and the Sabbaths. Why then was he so angry with them for doing it? Ah, you must remember, in our last lesson, we talked about the purpose behind commandments. There was always a, the commandments of God were always a means to an end. When you command your child to stand in the corner, it's not because you want them to stand in the corner the rest of their lives, but it's because you want them to learn some more important lesson in life. And God said the ultimate end of his commandments was love. He wanted people to love him, and he also wanted them to love one another. But these people had gone through the rituals and made them empty and meaningless because they had missed the point of love. So Isaiah continued. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. How is a faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. The silver has become dross, thy wine is mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. They judge not the fatherless neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. The same thing is stated over in the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Here Isaiah said, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. Here were people who were praying every day. They delighted to know my way. They wanted to study the Bible as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice, and they take delight in approaching unto God. Wherefore have we fasted, they say, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You fast for strife and debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high, is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Now you remember in our last lesson we quoted from Hosea 6, 6 and Micah 6 and verses 6 through 8. What does the Lord really want? Does he really want to just see blood drip down an altar? Or as Isaiah said, does he just want to see you bow your head like a bulrush? Is that the reason why we have the Bible? just so that men will bow their heads? No, it involves positive relationships, which you will have with someone else. So Isaiah continued, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? and that thou bring in the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. That's what God has always wanted. He has wanted you and me to be like he is. He has wanted us to be like Jesus. He decided that he would literally come to the earth himself so that we might understand his nature and so that we might walk in his footsteps. John was one of the last of the apostles to experience physical death. He began his relationship with Jesus as a very volatile 
individual who was called a son of thunder. He and his brother James were so angry and so easily excited that they would erupt like a thunderstorm at the slightest provocation. Jesus called them Boanerges, which means the sons of thunder. But after a few years with Jesus, and after the Holy Spirit dwelt in his heart, John became known, rather, as the apostle of love. We're going to conclude our lesson today by reading from 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let's love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he is given unto us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who love God love his brother also. Thank you. Thank you.